Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We're living in a divided time. This country is divided right down the middle. There is an enormous amount of anger. There's rage. There's hatred. We see demonstrators screaming at each other, reflecting that rage, reflecting that anger. And I know there are a great many Americans who wish we could and believe we can get back to an environment where we treat each other with civility and decency. Get back to an environment where, yes, we have policy disagreements, we disagree on what the right legislation is to pass, and we even have vigorous debates about what the right policy is. But we do so in a context that respects each other, that doesn't demean the humanity of each other, that doesn't attack the character and drag people through the mud. The politics of personal destruction that we have seen on display in recent days is Washington, D.C. at its very ugliest. And all of us should remember that we're talking about real human beings here. These aren't pawns on a chessboard. These are real people. Dr. Ford has been through hell. The last two weeks, I have no doubt, have been extraordinarily painful for her, for her family. The testimony she gave yesterday was powerful. It was clearly heart-wrenching. It was clear she was hurting and hurting mightily. Having her name made public against her wishes and dragged through the mud was a hurtful thing to do. It was a wrong thing to do. And Judge Kavanaugh, he too has been dragged through the mud for the last two weeks in a way that has no precedent. In our polarized society we live in today, it's almost tribalized. Where half of us wear one team's jersey, the other half wear the other team's jersey. And everything we see, we see through the lens of our jersey. So it would not surprise me if across the country, a significant percentage of those on the Democratic side of the aisle saw yesterday's testimony and concluded he must be guilty. And it would not surprise me if a very significant percentage of those on the Republican side of the aisle saw yesterday's testimony, the same testimony, and concluded he must be innocent. One of the consequences of that, you know, Judge Kavanaugh talked about how these smears and the many that have been leveled against him in the last two weeks, how they have, as he put it, destroyed his family. To some that may sound like hyperbole. I don't think it is. Judge Kavanaugh has two young daughters, a 10-year-old and a 13-year-old. For the rest of their lives, their, his, their daughters will go to school, will interact with people, many of whom are convinced their father is a rapist. I want you to think of the effect that has when those are the allegations. That's where it starts. Not, I disagree with your jurisprudence. Not, I think you're wrong in how you interpret the Constitution. But you are, I mean, and look, and let's be clear. He has been accused of, among other things, participating in repeatedly drugging and gang raping women to take some of the more sensational, I think, ludicrous claims that have been aired. These little girls are going to have classmates of theirs repeat those charges to them. Some of the most poignant testimony yesterday is when Judge Kavanaugh described how he's taught law at Harvard Law School for over a decade. And he said he may never get to teach law again. And that's entirely possible. That's entirely possible even if Judge Kavanaugh is confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court as a sitting justice in our polarized world. I'm a graduate of the Harvard Law School. I think it is entirely possible those on the left would say, we don't want someone we believe is a rapist ever teaching again. 
He also talked about how much he has loved coaching girls basketball, coaching his daughters in basketball. And he mentioned he may never coach again. That's a very real possible consequence of the mudslinging and irresponsible behavior of the last two weeks. It may well be in this tribalized, partisan, divided world that the parents of the other girls say, no, we don't want him as a coach anymore. Our words and actions have consequences. That being said, even though this is a divided time, even though this is a partisan time, I have faith in the American people. I have faith in the American people that we want to be fair-minded. We want to actually assess the facts. We want to actually assess what happens. I think it's important that once these allegations became public, that Dr. Ford was given a full and fair opportunity to tell her story. I emphatically urged my colleagues that was the right thing to do, to give her the opportunity to testify in public, and that it was important that when she testify, she be given an environment that was fair, that was respectful, that she not be demeaned, that she not be attacked, and she wasn't. That was the right thing to do. The committee, once this had been forced to the front pages of the paper, the right thing to do was give her a public forum and a full public forum to tell her story. But the right thing also re requires, and we saw yesterday Judge Kavanaugh being given a full and fair opportunity to defend himself. The American people watched that testimony. And you come away with a number of conclusions. Number one, it is clear their testimony is in direct conflict. What they said is directly conflicting. Judge Kavanaugh categorically and unequivocally denied the allegations. So the question is, how do you resolve that discrepancy? How does this committee, how does the United States Senate, how do the American people resolve the discrepancies when you have two witnesses that testify to things diametrically opposed? Well, the only way I know to do, and this is how a court of law operates, this is how most reasonable people operate, is when you have conflicting testimony, you look to, well, what does the rest of the evidence demonstrate? What other evidence is there and what does the evidence demonstrate? Dr. Ford named three fact witnesses who she, she says were there and could corroborate her story. None of the three corroborates her story. Not only do they not corroborate her story, all three of the named fact witnesses explicitly refuted her story. And they did so under penalty of perjury. They didn't do so lightly. They didn't just say it. They did so in a context that under the United States Code, they can face up to five years in prison if they lied to this committee. So every single fact witness that Dr. Ford named has explicitly disputed her allegations. Now, one of those fact witnesses was Mr. Judge. We've heard a lot of discussions about Mr. Judge. A lot of my colleagues saying, why didn't we hear testimony from Mr. Judge? Well, Mr. Judge refused to talk to the committee. He submitted a statement, a statement under penalty of perjury, under penalty of felony, but he refused to be interviewed by investigators. It's not complicated to understand why. The public record indicates Mr. Judge has had a very troubled life, that he has battled with addiction for most of his life. We heard testimony yesterday that he's been near death, that he battles with depression, that he's a cancer survivor. He has also been directly accused of multiple felonies. So when committee investigators asked to interview him, he said no. That shouldn't surprise anybody. We had a vote earlier today on subpoenaing Mr. Judge. It's not complicated what would happen if he were subpoenaed. If he came before this committee, any defense lawyer worth his salt would tell Mr. Judge not to testify. Now, I understand politically 
Democratic members of this Senate would very much like to see a man who struggled with addiction most of his life sitting before this committee and pleading the fifth. That would make great theatrics. That would make great political theatrics. It wouldn't help one iota in the search for the, for the truth, but it would make a great public show. And I will say of the three fact witnesses, the one who I think is most revealing is Leland Kaiser. Ms. Kaiser was close friends with Dr. Ford. Ms. Kaiser had every incentive to back up her story. And instead, Ms. Kaiser, under penalty of perjury, says she doesn't know Judge Kavanaugh, and she has no recollection of any party like the one Dr. Ford describes. Dr. Ford testified yesterday that Ms. Kaiser texted her after submitting that statement to say she was sorry, sorry for not backing up her story. I think that indicates powerfully that her incentives, if at all possible, were to back up the story, and yet she didn't feel she could. She had no incentive, no motive to lie, every incentive to agree with Dr. Ford's story, and yet she did not do so. So all three fact witnesses have explicitly disputed the allegations. What other evidence do we have? We have Judge Kavanaugh's calendars, detailed day-to-day. -day. I have to admit, when the calendars were first released, there were press stories about them. I didn't find that terribly persuasive evidence until Judge Kavanaugh walked through day by day each of the possible days when this was alleged to have happened and walked through the specific conflicts, how he was out of town for many of the days, how he had conflicts for many of the days, the notion that his calendars were almost like diaries, I, frankly, I think is kind of odd. That's not something many people do, but it appears to be something both he and his father do. That contemporaneous evidence that he kept in 1982, I'll tell you, in a court of law, that kind of contemporaneous evidence would be powerful. If you're trying to ascertain two conflicting witnesses and which one is telling the truth, you would look for contemporaneous evidence one way or the other. And finally, we know Judge Kavanaugh's impeccable record of decades of public service. He's 53 years old, and prior to two weeks ago, there have been no allegations whatsoever of this kind. Six FBI background checks, detailed, thorough FBI background checks, nobody raised any claim like this. Now, all of us know from human experience that if someone is a sexual predator, if someone is committing the kind of actions that have been alleged, that it is very rare that they're a one-time offender. That if someone is carrying out this kind of conduct, they typically have a pattern of doing so over and over and over again. We have seen powerful men throughout society, in politics, in journalism, in Hollywood, whose careers have rightly been ended, but they've been ended for a pattern of harassment and abuse that typically extends decades because when someone behaves like this, they behave like this over and over again. There's no credible indication that that's occurred. Indeed, it's striking that in his 12 years as a federal appellate judge, a majority of his law clerks have been women. That is exceptionally unusual. I do not know of another federal appellate judge for whom that is the case, and I can tell you his law clerks revere him. They hold him in the very highest of respect. His reputation, Judge Kavanaugh's reputation in this town, is of being a Boy Scout, is of being a boring Boy Scout. That's been his reputation for a long time. Now. Some might say, well, gosh, in the press, there have been these other sensational allegations. We've seen others that have popped up after this one. Well, I thought it was striking in yesterday's hearing that not a single Democratic member of this committee chose to ask about any of the other allegations. I think that indicates how little credibility there is behind those allegations. The one that is the most sensational by the client of Mr. Avenatti makes extraordinary claims, which apparently our Democratic colleagues are embarrassed to say publicly because they demonstrate that this has become a partisan circus. This is not about substance. 
This is about smears. Can, can I ask the senator if he could sum up? Uh, the reason I've done that is because I, I'd like to give everybody a chance to speak. This committee has given Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh a full and fair opportunity to lay out their views. And I will say, unfortunately, the conduct of our Democratic colleagues, it's been clear that this has been all about politics, all about delaying this confirmation until after the election, hoping that they win the Senate in the election, and then keeping this Supreme Court seat vacant until 2021. Every Democratic member of this committee, before the confirmation hearing started, said they opposed Judge Kavanaugh, before a single thing started. And not only that, this allegation, the ranking member of this committee had it in writing on July 30th. If on July 30th that had been reported to the committee chairman, this committee has a process to investigate it, a process to investigate it that is confidential, that the FBI could have participated in investigating, starting back in July 30th, that we could have had a hearing that is closed, that is not dragging either of these individuals through the mud. That's the way this process should have worked. And the testimony yesterday from Dr. Ford is that the only people who had copies of the letter were herself, her lawyers, Representative Eshoo, and the ranking member of this committee. Dr. Ford further testified that neither she nor her lawyers handed the letter over. That leaves the only conclusion possible is that the letter was leaked to the public by either of the two Democratic members of Congress or their staff or, the, or someone else to whom they gave it. If there are only four people that have it and two did not give it, then the, the other two are the only possible sources. And that, unfortunately, demonstrates a cynicism, a willingness to smear Dr. Ford if it helps politically delay this nomination. I think we have an obligation to be fair, to be impartial, to listen to the evidence, to weigh the evidence. That's the right thing to do, and that's what I hope this committee does, and that's what I hope the full Senate does.